So my talk today is about the genetics of depression, and I'm going to start by giving you an overview why that's an important thing to study, and then I'm going to give you a brief description of how we set about solving the problem of the genetics of depression, and I'll show you some of the results that we've obtained. So we've summarized what the problems are in terms of the number one, that it's ranked as the leading cause of disability in this country and will be worldwide by 2020, and that's a World Health Organization data point. One person will die of suicide every 30 seconds somewhere in the world. There are 800,000. And the majority of those are because people are depressed. And currently, in this country, there are 245 million antidepressant scripts written every year at a cost of something like $10 billion. And that is despite the fact half of our patients don't see any improvement with any of the therapies that we give them. And after more than two and a half decades of work, there have been no novel or more effective antidepressants brought to the market. So this is a very grim situation, and one of the things that's held us back here is that we really don't understand what causes depression. We know in the broadest sense that there are environmental stresses and that there are some biological triggers which include genetic, but other than that, we really are at a loss. And the situation is a bit like this, that we've had many, many people continuing to look in places where we already have some indication that there might be a cause. The consequences of giving people antidepressants, for example, has focused attention on a set of neurotransmitters which, to be quite frank, has not led to any novel insights into causation. Where we know that the situation probably should look like this, that if we were able to look outside this focus of attention, we would find the causes. So the question is, how can we get into that unexplored territory? And that's where genetics comes in, because genetics is a way of looking in an unbiased fashion across all of biology. And I think the, th the simplest way to think about this is that DNA is your wiring diagram. It encodes everything about you at a biological level. And what we're looking for are those small differences in the DNA sequence that contribute to the risk of you becoming ill. So that's essentially our thinking about this problem. But we face a difficulty. So I'm just going to show you, for those of you not familiar, uh, with the, um, the way that geneticists now show analyses of complex traits. This is called a genome-wide association study. And the way that the data are laid out is that there are chromosomes on the horizontal axis. And the vertical scale gives the likelihood that any position in the genome is contributing to risk. And the little dotted line that's running horizontally is a significance threshold. So anything that creeps above that threshold, we regard as potentially interesting, contributing in this case to the risk of Alzheimer's disease, coronary artery disease, and type 2 diabetes. These names here represent genes. Uh, I should emphasize, for those of you who are not familiar with this technology, that it does not identify genes, despite what this and other diagrams might tell you. It simply indicates positions in the genome. But that's a, a detail, but an important one. So, the, so you can see that for common disorders, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, Alzheimer's, if we apply this approach, we're pretty successful. We find many things. And you can see I've left a big gap here for major depressive disorder. So I'm going to show you the result from that and let you interpret it. So this is from the uh, UK Biobank, which is a sample of 100,000 people. This is a, a clever study design where they're able to, to uh, use information from relatives and other things. I won't go necessarily into it. I'm just showing you because I think this is a very uh, clear demonstration that genetic approaches have been successful in some conditions, but not so far in major depressive disorder. So we have to ask, really, why has it been so difficult to find the genetic basis of depression? And I'll just run through three possibilities. The first is a very straightforward one, because it's a psychiatric disease, and all psychiatric diseases are difficult to study. So I have been at conferences where molecular biologists have stood up and told the psychiatrists this is a complete waste of time studying a psychiatric disease because they really don't know how to diagnose it and make any, any progress with it. Now we can 
immediately dismiss this objection because there is one disorder, schizophrenia, which has been successfully approached using genome-wide association, and I'll show you that result next. So this is the genome-wide association, and it's interpreted just in the way that I've shown you before. Anything that exceeds this line here is a significant result, and there, indeed there are 108 positions in the genome from this study published in 2014. That consortium, the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, has continued to amass samples, and I think there are now something like 250 loci. So just because something is a psychiatric disorder does not mean it is intractable genetically. So that can't be the reason. A second reason might be that it's not very heritable. Schizophrenia has a heritability of about 80%, so maybe that's why it's been successful. I'll just show you the data for depression on heritability, and I'm going to show you this from some old data. This is from family and twin studies from my colleague Ken Kendler. What we're showing you here are summaries from the most robust, by certain criteria, twin studies. And he's showing you the results from male and female, and down at the bottom, there's a summary of the data. So the vertical notch here represents the uh, measure of heritability and the length of the horizontal line, the um, confidence that we have in the estimate. And as you can see, this is a pretty good estimate, and it's about 37%. To put that into perspective, the heritability of type 2 diabetes, and I showed you the results for type 2 diabetes a moment ago, heritability for type 2 diabetes is about 40%. So this is well within the limits of a disease that should be tractable by genome-wide association. So I, I will happily put that second explanation to bed and say it's not because it's uh, an, uh, a lacking in heritability. The third explanation is maybe it's not one disease. One disease or many, we can put it that way. Let's suppose that you come to me and you say you have a high temperature. I can easily validate that with a thermometer, and I can say, I agree with you, you've got a high temperature, and I'm going to make a diagnosis of fever, and I'm going to give you some uh, uh, antipyretics, and um, that'll make the fever go away, and you'll be better. Would that be acceptable? No, of course not. I'd be struck off the medical register if I did that sort of thing, because everyone knows that there are 101 different causes. And if we just treated fever as a phenotype and mapped it, we'd be including cancer, infectious disease, autoimmune disease, metabolic conditions, a whole range of things. So is it possible that depression is like that? And the reason we're having difficulties is because we're lumping lots of things together under that category. So I'll give you a couple of bits of evidence why I think this is true. The first is genetic. So again, I'm showing you some results from twin studies. The horizontal axis just shows the two twin studies, and the vertical axis is a measure of heritability for the blue and the red columns, which are respectively those for females and, and males. And you can see that it is a more heritable condition in women. These are, are large sample sizes, so that those are statistically significant differences. But the reason I'm showing you this graph is not because of the blue and red columns, because of this one here, the green correlation, the green bar, which represents genetic correlation between men and women. If the same variants were contributing, then the correlation should be 100%, and it's not. It's more like 55, 60%. So at a genetic level, a large proportion of the variation is not shared. So at a genetic level, we can't consider it to be the same disease. What about at the environmental level? Remember I said, in general terms, we have two causes, environment and genetics. So let's consider what might make you depressed. So in our profession, when you send off your greatest piece of work to an important journal, and you have it sent back straight away, we're not going to send this out to review, that we regard as a stressful life event. And indeed, if you spend a very long time on this piece of work, it will make you very unhappy, and I'm telling you that from personal experience. Now, we know that a stressful life event has a very specific relationship to depression, and that is to say, if you have a stressful life event, then within about three months or so, you should have that episode of depression. But if it's longer than that, then with some degree of certainty, I can say that that stressful life event did not cause that episode of depression. So if you come to me and you say, I've had a really bad time, Dr. Flynn. I'm you know, so miserable. I'm thinking of killing myself. And I say, well, what happened to you? Or that paper that went to Nature, you should have seen the reviews. They was just like <laughs> grim, you know, so bad. 
And I said, when was this? Oh, it was a couple of years ago, and I'm really, you know, I'm pretty certain that is not why you're depressed at that particular time. So we understand that sort of temporal relationship, but there are other forms of things which can really screw you up. And the worst of all is bad things happening to you in childhood, and I'll talk a bit more about this later. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because if we then plot what happens to somebody over the rest of their life, it looks something like this. And we have good reasons, I won't go through them, to say this is causative, in the same way that I can say this is causative, but clearly this cannot be acting through the same pathway. Because I've made clear to you these single events have this rather specific temporal relationship. So again, we're pointing out two different ways in which you can come dep depressed, two different pathways. So we think that depression is indeed different disorders. We're seeing some final common outcome, and it's both biologically and environmentally different. So how do we go about trying to tease that apart and use that insight to make sure that we can find the genetic roots? So we set up the Converge study to address this. We chose, for not very good reasons, a sample size of 6,000 cases and 6,000 controls. To be quite honest, it was a guess. We didn't know. But the rest of the study was more informed. We chose to study only women, and I've shown you the reason why. There's differences between the sexes in terms of genetic risk. It made sense to go for those who had the higher genetic determination, the higher heritability, which were women. We know that people who have multiple episodes of depression have higher biological risk factors in terms of the nature of the disorder and indeed of the heritability. So it made sense to go to people who had recurrent depression. Those things we can select for, we can include people who are women and those who have multiple episodes. And I've told you that there's lots of other things, like the environment, which are important, which are probably separating out different conditions. But it's very difficult for us when we set up the study to exclude people who have had a bad life event without spending a long time talking with them. So essentially, they were getting included in the study to start with. So the way we deal with that is that we ask them about all of this stuff, so we can include it in our modeling. So personality, childhood sexual abuse, stressful life events, poor parenting, low social support, well validated risk factors for this condition. There's a host of other details, which I won't, don't need to go into now, but you can get some feel that by the time we've made these distinctions in choosing a certain group, and by the time we've said, we need to get a lot of information, it means that we're going to have to screen a lot of people, and therefore we need to go to somewhere where there is a very large population, and ideally a place which has lots of big hospitals with lots of patients and with doctors we can work with. And that's essentially why we chose to do this study in China. Big population, lots of depressed people, lots of good doctors. This uh, is my colleague, Professor Kendler, and um, he's working with Yang Fu Zhong in one of our uh, training sessions. So one of the critical things to get this to work was to us to make sure we had very high quality phenotypic data. So we spent a long time working with groups of Chinese doctors. We'd bring them in for a week. We'd give them these, uh, these laptops, which you can see here, and everyone's clutching what we would call their Bible. It's a set of instructions as to how to give the interview. It takes about an hour and a half, two hours. And they're taught never to deviate from um, the true path. We don't let anyone out into the field, as it were, until we've listened to them give two or three interviews. We had a team of interviewers uh, sorry, editors who would then listen to the interviewers. About 10% of all of the data we collected was uh, listened to in this way. We ended up with about, I'd say, 200 people that we trained as interviewers. And we started this study in 2008 in Shanghai. And I'll just show you what our progress looked like over the following four years. So the black line here is the case uh, collection rate, and the red line is the controls. And there's a couple of interesting things to note about this graph. The first is you can see that the slope changes as we go through. It's a very slow slope here. This is when we started the project in 2008. And for the first uh, four or five months, we were on this sort of tra trajectory, which you can see was not a good trajectory to be on if I was going to complete this study in my lifetime. 
So we then enrolled a, a set more hospitals, and they gave us more patients, and now you can see that it begins to get better, but it tails off a little, and at this stage things are really getting bad, and then we get some more hospitals involved, and things begin to improve. The second thing you can note are these rather strange step-like structures here, which are occurring at regular intervals throughout the collection period. These used to give me a lot of pain, because it means that nothing is happening for two weeks a year. Why is this? It's because all of China goes on holiday. This is the New Year Festival. Uh, there's another one here, which is the National uh, uh, Festival in, in October, when they spend another week on holiday. Um, we took, as you can see, about four years to get this study done. And as a consequence, I would be visiting a large number of hospitals to make sure that things proceeded. We, in the end, had 60 hospitals in about 30 cities across China. And I'm just going to give you a, f a brief flavor of what this is like. So I would go and discuss uh, progress we, with the hospitals, and we'd um, meet. And then I'd move on to the next hospital, discuss progress, and then visit the next hospital, and the hospital after that, and the hospital after that, and the hospital after that, and the hospital after that. And you can see this is a fairly exhausting process. After four years, when we had completed our sample, we then took the uh, DNA to um, BGI. It's a large genome sequencing center in the south of China. For those of you not familiar with this, BGI, you might think, stands for Beijing Genomics Institute and therefore might be near Beijing. It's actually 3,000 miles away in the south in Shenzhen. Uh, it's the largest sequencing center still in the world. And, of course, what they wanted to do was sequence our samples. Now. We didn't have enough money to do what most people would regard as proper sequencing, which would be coverage of 10, 20, 30, 40, 30 or 40-fold. So we did something slightly uh, unusual, which is that we got a sequence coverage, which is shown here, of about a median of about 1.7. So for those of you who haven't thought about this before, the problem can be conceptualized in the following way. So the data we get would look something like this. Some cases we get both alleles at a position. Many times we have nothing at all. And many times we just have it on one, uh, one chromosome. And we have to fill in the gaps. And the way we do that is uh, by imputation. And we're able to use haplotype reference maps to work out the likely correlation uh, at any particular locus and uh, fill, in, fill in the gaps, as, as you can see here. Easy to state, this took about two years to get done, because we had 12,000 genome sequences, uh, about, what was it, 40-something terabytes of data. This took a long time. And I, I remember when we were doing some genotyping uh, to confirm what we get from the sequence data, uh, the graduate student who was working on it looked at me and said, that took a week. Why didn't you do the whole sample like this? We could have saved ourselves about a year and a half. And um, there's some truth in that, and we argue whether this was the best way to go. And I'll show you one reason later on why we think this approach is particularly useful. But uh, I'm happy to argue this. Just to give you a feel as to how, how well we did, this is a, a measure of our imputation accuracy. I'm showing you here the, um, the uh, allele frequencies on the horizontal axis. So we're really interested in common variation. That's things with frequencies above 5%, which is on here. And you can see that well, we do well here. So the mean aggregate is about, um, um, this is comparison to some genotype data, is about 0.9. So if you think about it, if I'd done an array, then we would have got maybe 500,000 and a million positions in the genome done with very, very high ac accuracy. But we'd have to fill in the rest of the genome. We have 20 million sites here by imputation, and there we might get it with an accuracy of 0.7 or 0.8, whereas here, like across the genome, at every site that's common, we're getting an accuracy of about 0.9. So there's a balance here as to what is more useful. We think this was helpful. I want to just tell you one brief thing. So what was really cl critical for us was, was making sure we had good quality data, and this takes a very long time. And there are all sorts of traps here, and I'll just show you one that turned up when we were trying to work if there's any contamination across samples. So we're processing very large numbers of samples, lots of different data sets. So how do we make sure that everyone's who they say they are? So I'm showing you some sequence reads. Now here you can see we've got good coverage. And you might think, 
why is that? You told me it was only 1.7x. And the reason we have good coverage is because this is a bit of mitochondrial DNA. So each cell, although it only has uh, one genome, has many mitochondrial genomes. And I'll talk a bit about that later. So we get sometimes even 100x coverage across the mitochondrial genome. So we sequence the mitochondria pretty well. And each of these bars here represents a sequencing read, and the little vertical lines represent deviations from the known sequence. And what was odd about this is that there was a whole set of them, as you can see here, or you can see over here, where we had really quite marked deviation from the known uh, reference genome. And these weren't uh, one single read which is getting copied multiple times. You can see these, they, they, they're, we're, get, we're getting multiple um, reads that show this. And also, it's not present in every single um, position. So there's a, so we, we're here we're getting some sequence and this maps to the same place but doesn't show this variation. And that's very unusual because it's basically the case that the, the mitochondrial genome is homoplasmic. That's to say it's the same sequence wherever. So this degree of what's called heteroplasmy was very strange. So we looked at this and I said to the student, can you just check what, where this sequence comes from? The mitochondrial genome contains many copies which are in the nuclear genome. So it might be that we're just getting some mismapping. Could it be that? But she did something slightly more sensible, which is just to see generally where that sequence came from, and came up with this. You can see this is the match from this particular uh, bit of sequence. It's a 100% match. Uh, what you can't see is actually what the result is, which is written down here in very small letters, because it was deeply embarrassing. It says Sus scrofa domesticus, <laughs> the common pig. Oh, yeah, well, that was really weird. So why on earth would we have pig DNA in our Chinese samples? Well, the answer is because the DNA that we were extracting came from saliva. We're sequencing these people's dinner. <laughs> but that told us a number of things. It told us that we could use these sorts of things to clear out crap. So we could identify things within the sequence which would indicate whether people had got mixed up. So levels of heteroplasmy indicate we've got samples, sample confusion, we've got contamination from other sources, all sorts of things. So the sequence is really helpful in this way because it allows you to pick up a whole set of problems in your data which you don't otherwise have access to. So I'm just giving you that as one anecdote to emphasize the great importance of making sure when you do these studies, you really worry about the quality, not just of the phenotypes, but of the genotypes as well. Yes? So how do you make sure you don't get pigotosomal DNA? How do you make sure you, don't, you, get make sure you don't sequence pigotosomal DNA? Mm -hmm. we, we just chuck those samples out. We don't risk it. Because we couldn't tell. Because there's going to be such a lot of homology, at least of the exomic regions. So and Yes, exactly so. We use that as a way of just saying, look, there's really something we don't trust about this sample. There's not many in here. I mean, we didn't sequence everyone's dinner. It's like, this was just to show you that we can use these approaches. You need vegetarians. Uh, yeah, that might work. A lot of Buddhists, that would help. So I want to show you now the results we got. Um, this is another um, simple uh, Manhattan plot. So this is um, just the same structure. And you can see that now we do indeed uh, find things, and we find this with about, uh, after cleaning the data, I said we aimed to get 12,000, we did indeed get 12,000, we chucked quite a lot out because of this cleaning business, so 5,300 cases, 5,300 controls, and we find something. This is a zoom in at the locus, so there's a, a um, DNA shock protein here and a sirtuin gene here, the locus is between the two. So for those of you who know about the biology, this is an interesting gene. It's already been implicated in, in it's a NAD plus acetylase. It's a, uh, a whole s literature on this from Lenny Guaranti in terms of its effects on aging and me controlling metabolism. Um, but just to go back to what I said earlier, just because you find a locus doesn't mean that the closest gene is the one that's involved. But, so take that as a, a, a warning about that. The second gene, and I've had to write down its name because it's long and I can never remember it. This is enzyme down here, uh, LHPP. It lies in the, in the, in, in the uh, intron of this, uh, this gene. And this is essentially a gene of, of, of not of known function. Now, I'm sure all of you will realize that just because we find in our study a result it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And we'd like to somehow replicate our findings. So here are my new best friends in Beijing who helped me. And they happen to have a sample, not as big as ours, but, but of a few thousand. 
and kindly agreed to let us genotype at these two positions. So let me just show you the replication results. So these are the, the two loci that uh, showed significance. I'm showing you the odds ratios here relative to the uh, reference allele. That's why they go in different directions and, and the p-values. And let me show you what we get from the replication results. So uh, they gave us about 7,000 samples, and both those loci did replicate. And here is the joint values, where we have now a sample size of about 17,000. So to the extent that we've met criteria, we've found something to meet some threshold, and we replicated, we can say we now have a robust replicated finding. I think the first question we need to ask, though, is why were we successful? Given, as I've shown you, that people have tried this with much larger sample sizes and not discovered anything. And I will go back to what I said before in terms of this being our ability to dissect the disease at a phenotypic level. And I can now answer that question about how diverse it might be from a genetic perspective. And I'll give you two examples. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about is the severity of the illness. We'd expect that to be a more severe illness, possibly to be more genetically determined. And the second is a reduced effect of the environment. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment. So a severe illness. Let me deal with that first. So for many, many years, psychiatrists have had a sort of diagnosis of, of, of melancholia. These are the criteria. Um, the most important one for us is the higher familiar liability, liability in co-twins. In other words, it should have a more genetic, uh, a, a higher heritability. And um, we asked, therefore, if we just focused on that group who have got melancholia, do we see an, uh, an alteration in our genetic signal? So these are the results from just studying the uh, melancholia. And you can see that uh, we still see two loci, but this one has increased in significance. And I'll just to sh to show you that when we zoom in. So this is the melancholia sample, and this is the people with depression, and there's a, an increase in the genetic signal. Obvious question, could that be due to chance? We've removed about, note here, 4,500 as against 5,300. So we've, we've taken out a number of our cases uh, to see this. So what happens if I just take out a random set of cases to equal this number, repeat my analysis. How often do I see an increase in the signal in equal or greater magnitude uh, that, than that result? So here's that analysis. This is uh, showing the odds ratio as the output. So this is the odds ratio that we actually saw, this line here. And this distribution represents as subsampling thousands of times from that population, repeating the analysis and reporting back the odds ratio. And this shows that there was about a uh, bit over 1% chance that we would have seen this. So unlikely to have occurred by chance. The second thing I want to tell you briefly about is what I call the reduced effect of the environment. What do I mean by that? So let me go through this. I told you childhood sexual abuse is a really, really bad thing. It's also very hard to get information we have to ask very direct questions, and we have to do it in a way that's sensitive and um, would allow people to tell us. So we have a questionnaire which we give people, and then they answer these questions. We take those data, and then we divide up the abuse into three forms, non-genital, genital, and intercourse. And here are the odds ratios. So this is fairly typical. It's what is seen in the literature. Note that there's an increase as we go from the less severe to the more severe forms, consistent but not proving that there is a causal relationship. The sample size for this study is relatively small, but as I've said, there are difficulties about collecting this data. I would assume many people haven't actually told us what's going on, but those are the numbers for what they're worth. So the assumption here is that we have a very severe risk factor to depression, and therefore there will be a group of people in our study who are depressed for environmental, not genetic reasons. Yes? Yes, they do. This is in both cases in controls, yes. Clearly it's enriched in the cases, but it's for both. Roughly we have the same number of cases in controls. Yes, exactly so. Yep. So what we do is we now take out that sample, and then we reanalyze the data. And our question was, what do we see? again, the same question, do we see a change in the genetic signal? And this is what we saw. And surprisingly, we now get a third 
signal that becomes statistically significant, and we get indeed an increase in the two that we already knew about. And given the small number that we extracted from this, I was quite surprised. So the, the, the third locus we now get is uh, uh, next to this transporter here. Uh, and lies on the other side by a transcription factor. And then we do the same thing. We ask whether there's a, a, a significant enrichment. So this is for the, um, um, that's the LHPP locus. This is for CERT1. And this is for this uh, spike by this um, transport water locus. So there's some indication that two of those loci seem indeed to show this relationship with the environment. So there's some enrichment that's happened there. I want to finish by giving you um, another reason why I think it was useful for us to have collected the sequence, another insight that we got into, into depression. So remember we have this very low sequence coverage, and remember that I told you that there is this organelle, the mitochondrion, in each cell which contains multiple copies of its own um, genome, and therefore we sequence that at great depth. We made the following observation. Here I'm showing you the cases and controls, and I'm showing you on this axis the normalized amount of mitochondrial DNA. So we compare that to the genomic DNA, we normalize it, and then we look in the cases and controls, and we find a highly significant difference. Why would that be? Remember we collected the DNA from saliva, so I had a number of concerns that this, this must be an artifact. Maybe it was a drug effect. If you take antidepressants, which many of our patients were, was that increasing the amount of mitochondria in the, the saliva, in the DNA in the saliva? So we spent a lot of time giving drugs to mice and seeing whether we could reproduce this effect. We couldn't. We looked in our patients who said that they had never received, recently at least, an antidepressant. Could we see any difference between those who did and didn't? Couldn't see that. So we couldn't convince ourselves that it was that. One more intractable problem was maybe it was a change in cellular composition. Maybe in the people who were depressed, maybe the saliva con cellular constitution had changed. This seemed to me extremely unlikely because so many people have been looked at in terms of cellular composition because a biomarker in depression will be such a great finding. But nevertheless, it remained a, a problem for us. So the way we addressed this was to look at the methylation state of the DNA. We didn't actually have access to the saliva, but we could check its composition by looking at its methylation. So if you remember, methylation is a marker of uh, differences between cell types. And you can tell what cell is, what, sorry, what tissue a cell uh, comes, uh, DNA comes from by looking at its methylation state. So this is a sort of summary of the data that uh, we, we looked at. We chose an, a number of different um, methylation marks known from the literature to indicate cellular composition. We, ha we know basically what saliva consists of. We check this ourselves. It's mostly white cells. There's some fibroblasts in there as well. So we take all of the markers and we look across our cases our, and our controls. And then we ask, is there a difference in the distribution? And you can see looking at that, there, is, there appears to be a slight difference. And indeed, there, there is to some extent. But then if we take that into account, we, don't, we are unable to explain the difference in the amount of mitochondrial DNA. So this is, the, as it were, the main effect of DNA on the sample that we did the methylation analysis on. We didn't do it in the entire 12,000. We just took a, a subsample. And this is what we see when we take the residuals of the methylation analysis. So we couldn't convince ourselves that was the explanation. So what might be contributing to that? And we noticed one rather unusual thing, going back to this business of stress. Here I'm plotting out our measures of childhood sexual intercourse against the amount of mitochondrial DNA. And you can see that the people who had more severe forms seem to show an increase. Why might that be? We don't understand this and still don't understand it yet, but this is, becomes now a, a testable hypothesis because now I can find a model organism and I can give it a really bad time. I'm not going to go into the details of what actually we did to the mice, but I will show you the results. So we're now going to see the effects of stress on the mitochondrial DNA of mice. So the stressed animals are here in the red boxes. This is a, a measure per week, and it's the mitochondrial DNA on the horizontal axis. And two, two important things. Clearly, it increases. We've replicated that. We can, this is a, a nice, robust result. And then you can see that from four to eight, things change. And that's because we stop stressing the animals here, let them return to normal. 
And this indicates that this is probably a dynamic response. We don't understand what this is. We are spending some time trying to establish whether it might be a useful biomarker. Uh, but it's just another indication to you that getting sequence is actually very useful. So just to summarize, I've reported two replicate lo replicated loci that contribute to major depression and melancholia, the LHPP and CERT1 loci. I've shown you that melancholia, a severe form of depression, has an increased genetic signal at one locus. And I've shown you that if you remove a severe environmental determinant, you can increase the genetic signal. And finally, I've shown you that cases have increased amounts of mitochondrial DNA for reasons that we don't fully understand. And this was a study, as you've seen, carried out in China by a large number of hospitals, and particularly with a lot of help from my colleagues in BGI, who I went out to dinner with a lot. Thank you very much.